Welcome back, everybody. These chairs feel new. It's because they are. They're new. Are you okay? I'm all right, yeah. <laughs> all right, so obviously, uh, as you all know, this is the legendary Bob Gurr here. Give him another round of applause, please. Um, if you've never met Bob before, uh, Bob is, to me, like, he's one of these guys that's just approachable. Yesterday, we saw him at the Outer Rim. If you were there, you might have seen him there. And we talked for five minutes just about my T-shirt I was wearing. And Bob just goes and talks, and, like, the, the knowledge that comes out of him is just insane. So I love talking with you. I'm so excited to do this. It's super fun. We're going to treat this kind of like our podcast, if you listen, where you guys send in questions and I sift through them and answer them. And this isn't like Stump Bob Gurr, but it kind of is because we're going to see sort of what we can ask him and maybe something that he might not know the answer to, but I bet he does most times. So, all right, here we go. You ready? I'm always ready. All right. <laughs> Tell us about, now these don't all have names, so I'm sorry if I don't uh, say your name. I'm just going to go through in the essence of time here. <laughs> Tell us about the first time you met Walt. I was never introduced. Why not? Oh, it was a Saturday morning. We we're talking about an Utopia car. They had a chassis. They needed a body. And there was some guys out there talking about it. And uh, we had a spare tire available. You know, guys put their foot on the tire and do this and cogitate. Sure. And uh, as older guy walked up, kind of ratty, unshaven looking guy. I thought he was a uh, father of one of the night guards because it was Saturday and nobody there. We talked about the car, and then the guy walked off, and everybody said, see you, Walt. <laughs> I didn't know what he looked like. <laughs> Came back the next Saturday with more drawings. Same thing. He started asking me about my books. How did this guy that I don't even know knew my, about my books? Well, Walt always knew about everything on people that he was going to hire. I, there was something very unique about him. So uh, we just started working immediately, and I, would, I never got around to being introduced to him. We just worked there. All right, so there's that one. <laughs> All right, here, this is a good one, and I really want you to dig deep on this one. What is the craziest thing that did not go right? Craziest thing that did not go right. The answer will be from now till next Tuesday. Okay. Well, we got uh, 26 was, minutes, so. There was, there was a lot of stuff we don't talk about, and a lot of stuff we don't even record, and some of it's not in our hidden archives. Yeah, there was some stuff that... Uh, Absolutely didn't work, but it was none of it that I did, you know. Oh, it wasn't your fault, sure. <laughs> All right, fair, fair enough. Everything went right with you. All right, here's a good one. Early in my career, not me, I was a Main Street vehicle cast member at Disneyland. As a fan of the Omnibus, how did you come up with the design of that vehicle? Oh, it was very simple. Walt came into my office one day, and, you know, he just sits there, and he has an idea, and he goes, Bobby, we don't have a double-deck bus on Main Street. No, we don't. And I says, well, I know there's one at Travel Town across the river. I can get all the dimensions for it. And then Walt says, just a minute. I'll be right back. I have a dinky toy I bought in London. I'll run up and get it and come back. Dinky toy, they're a little tiny thing like that. And it was a typical 1905 to 1910 English uh, uh, omnibus. And so I said, well, you know, my father used to drive the double-deck omnibus on Sunset Boulevard. And so I went and got the dimensions from this uh, coach across the street. But Disneyland is kind of in smaller scale. So what I had to do to do some trickery to make the bus smaller than a normal bus would be. If anybody rides in the bus, you'll notice when you go in the bus, the, on the lower part, you sit facing inward with a low headroom, but you can walk in the aisle. When you go to the top deck, which everybody does, you're sitting in the center looking out. And under that seat, I got an extra two and a half foot of headroom, which made the whole bus smaller. Then uh, I bought a beer truck chassis, which has a drop chassis on it, which got everything down even smaller. So there's a lot of tricks that go with a car design. Uh, but it worked out real simple, real nice. We had a, some there. We got some here. In fact, in the World Showcase, remember, we used to drive them here? Correct. 
one of those escaped, and I saw the guy who repainted it, and he wants $400,000 for it. Wow. Ooh, so somebody still loves it. Yeah, that's, well, they're, they were in Kissimmee, I believe, if somebody can correct me. Somebody post them on Twitter. Uh, all right, next up, here, this is a good one, and I, it, I, I kind of have an idea on this because I'm, I'm a car guy like you. We, we sort of think like that sort of stuff. What's it like, those sourcing parts for projects in those early days? Where'd you go? What'd you do? I had a favorite junkyard about two miles I away. I love a good junkyard. <laughs> yeah. How much stuff you can yeah. fit in your pockets, too. That's the trick. No, no, it, no, it's very simple because a lot of vehicle stuff, there's no point inventing anything like a fancy engineer. I'm not an engineer. I have no engineering training, but I know junkyards. Uh, an example, if you look at the little red car at Disneyland, that's a, that's a uh, 1954 Chrysler Imperial steering gear. The pedals are a 1948 Mercury. Uh, on and on, we did that with different vehicles. Uh, if you look at the um, fire engine, the chassis and powertrain is the same as the red car and the yellow car. Oddly enough, the first uh, red car, without inventing anything from the radiator, the engine, the uh, flywheel housing, flywheel, the transmission, which is a Warner T9 from a taxi cab, all the way to the drive shaft and the rear axle, which is a Jeep axle, all the way to the back, that's all junkyard stuff. Yes. That's so, the way you do it. So you had to really remember, though, where you got the stuff, and if something broke, you had to remember this parts from this. No, these, these were uh, uh, ordinarily available stuff. Well, yeah, that, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Instead yeah. of creating a custom drive no, shaft. No, you, you never want to invent anything. You want to buy something that's been around a long, long time. Yeah, tried and true. Of all the vehicles you've designed for Disney, which one do you think is the most underappreciated? Nobody underappreciates anything I do. Are you ever surprised an attraction you worked on has lasted as long as it has? Is there one attraction that you're like, this is never going to make it, and it has? Well, here, here's a curious thing. As we were trying to get Disneyland open and then trying to do something for 56, I don't have any recollection that this thing would ever last. Uh, it, was a, it was a struggle. So I never had a feeling that we were doing anything that would endure, anything that would be classic. It's just another amusement park. But by the, about 1960, it looked like, hey, this is, this is serious. And look, today, we're here. This is serious stuff. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Um, so that's the best way I can answer that. Okay. Uh, this is another one from the same person, because this is another good question. Did Walt ever discuss his plans for Epcot with you personally? We were so involved in everything. you got to remember, Walt, yes, he's CEO, he's in his office, but he's running around the studio all the time, running around wet all the time. So there's ongoing conversations constantly um, sometimes not even meeting, just sometimes he'll drop by or, you know, my office or he'll ask something or two or three people are chattering. It's kind of an ongoing mix of stuff without ordinary schedules. This is, it, the companies are different today, but it was uh, so informal. But more to your point in your question, as we were flying in the uh, company plane to talk to General Electric, and talked to uh, Westinghouse in January 1966. We're all on the airplane. So yes, we got a big table going. We got drawings of uh, proposal idea Epcot. And Walt's talking to all of us about different things. And I remember uh, one, one point on the plane, he, was, he looked at me and he says, Bobby, he says, he says right here in the center of this place, uh, Lily and I are going to sit on a park bench and we're going to people watch. And I thought, you know, his heart, his heart is really in this Epcot thing. Okay. Can you recall, he spoke of WED, can you recall of any specific office hijinks happening at WED? <laughs> you said ask you anything. Um, the outgrowth out of the Disney studio, you got to remember, good animators are gag men first. Uh, gag men play tricks on each other all the time. It's, 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 
It gets worse than the, the bucket of water on the door. Uh, it gets into simple stuff, and one of them was where um, underneath a desk in the next room, a guy drilled a hole in the, in the wall, and he had a little a tube, and he'd get talcum powder, and uh, it would blow it on the guy <laughs> underneath the desk. <laughs> and the guy didn't notice it. He gets up to go to a meeting. He's, okay, you got... <laughs> That's a yeah, good one. I mean, yeah, we, we were crazy people. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any underdeveloped rides you designed that you wish you could have made or undeveloped? Anything that was like on the drawing board, didn't get to that point, that you wish would have made it to happen? That's a hypothetical question. History went that way. We're going that way. I have no answer. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk Disney World here. Have you been here before? Obviously you have, but just as a guest, just to walk around, and what's that like? If you have, you know, on October 1st last year, they asked me to come down here and take a look. And it was a very, very eerie feeling because as I walked around, we were doing a, a video shoot for TikTok. I'm on TikTok, my God. Are you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not even on TikTok. And I, got, on TikTok. I got one point million hits, you know. Wow. But anyway, um, I remember the park before it was a park. We came down here in the company plane, slowed down, put the flaps out, and we drove around the property. It took almost 20 minutes with our little company plane. And then to see it being built and being here in the months before we opened it, and then to go walking around with a film crew, there was a weirdest deja vu. It's, I had a feeling like, my God, I never left. It just, it's, it's hard to explain it. But it's, uh, the connection is so far away, but in my mind, it's so close. Okay. I'm only 91. I can remember all this stuff. You know? <laughs> You're doing good so far. I mean, gee. All right, fondest memory from your time at WED. You have to pick one. Fondest memory. Walt Disney, when any of us designed something that he really, really, really liked, when we opened the monorail, when he had his friend Dick Nixon come up to, to show it off, Walt was like a little kid with a toy, and his friend Dick Nixon, good friend, that was the first guy he wanted to show it off and to look at these guys while we're talking and look at eyebrow and that twinkle and that mischievous look on Walt. When you see it up close, it's like neon lights. It just, I never would see a person act that way. Now, that was the first, the, the monorail just had opened, right? That was the grand 1959. opening. 1959. Did anything go wrong that day? <laughs> Oddly enough, what went wrong was the day before. What happened? <laughs> For two weeks, we were testing the train. I'm the test driver, and it broke down every day. We fix, came up with a fix every day. The day before, uh, the train actually didn't break down, and so I parked it where we're going to cut the ribbon because we had a live television program. All they got to do is uh, drive it out of the shot, and they got their shot. Then they can break down, or we're fine. But Nixon and Walt and his family all come up, and they want to look at it. And they wanted me to give them a ride, and I was scared to death to drive it around because what if it broke down? Then we lose the show. It actually went around for the second time in its life, and we stopped it. And then, to a great surprise, you're, you're saying, what went wrong? What went right was the shocking thing. Uh, I hadn't had a chance to train any of the managers or the ride operators. I drove the media till 9 o'clock that night, and that train, I thought, every, any moment it's going to stop and catch on fire. And that, <laughs> and that doggone little red train, it ran perfect. And then I finally got Ken Kohler, the manager, to uh, know how to drive it. And I told my wife, come on, we're going home. And as we were going out the gate, I saw a big blue flash. And I just don't look back. <laughs> just keep on driving. The craziest thing was uh, the train stopped, the electrical shoe uh, fell off, didn't hurt anything, but it meant the vehicle has no power. 
uh, and because the lawyers did not want us to have an emergency air release on the, on the brakes when it locks up. And I said, we have to have it. And they said, well, you're not putting it on. So the train was stuck by the mountain with Walt and the president of General Dynamics and their little grandson who had to go. <laughs> That's what, yeah, usually happens. <laughs> so the very next morning, uh, the lawyer said, girl, you can put your bypass button anywhere you want it. <laughs> Oh, that solved the problem, but that was the that was the shocking thing. But I missed it. I went home. You did. How was this monorail opening? Did this one work flawlessly the first time? Oh, uh, this was a much longer development. Um, this monorail, the uh, Mark IV, was very complicated, very different kind of structure. I loved every detail on it because the way we design stuff, I do layouts by hand of every frickin' detail throughout the thing, even brackets and the rivet patterns, and then I hand them off to the drafters because I want everything exactly the way it's got to be. So there's a lot of development. We did a very steady uh, uh, test development, uh, and we didn't have anything unusual at, at all in the, in the Mark IV. The thing just, it just was just an easy-going machine because there was so much thought and care uh, put into that. So no surprises. Okay. So tell us a story, your favorite story, of how you tested and validated one of your Disney inventions. How I what? Tell us your favorite story of how you tested and validated one of your Disney inventions. I'm not an inventor. <laughs> that's, that's what it says. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Uh, in the matter of invention, Walt says, Bobby, I want you to get started on, so I do it. And then the patent office makes a patent later. Uh, so it says I'm an inventor, but I never considered it was inventing because we were just doing, combining known stuff, junkyard parts, everything else that we knew, and combining all that into a ride that Walt wanted. Simple as that. That was kind of a general uh, procedure. Um, the fact that as time went by, and then I kind of draw back and look at, somebody gave me a, a folder with 13 of my patents. And it kind of stalled me because I never saw myself as an inventor. And then I look and it's like, oh, it's got a patent number. I must be an inventor then. That's important, um, yeah. And people come up to me all the time with copies of these patents. You know, why don't you get a good looking picture? No, they want a patent drawing, you know, with a number on it. So I sign them. So it's kind sure. of a um, humbling thing. Okay. So this is more current. When's the last time you thought, Gee, that's a good idea to something in the parks or resorts. Like something new maybe you didn't come up with. Wow. You know this designing and upgrading Disney parks is so complex and it depends on a lot of, a lot of new tools. I'm kind of buffaloed to give an answer to that because it's so far beyond what we, what, what we were doing. But... To look at the tools that we've got with the CGI, some of the CGI stuff and all our shows now is just beyond my comprehension how that's uh, done. But I couldn't give you a specific answer because there's so, so much of it uh, through all our parks. Okay. This is a Houston airport people mover question. Where, where did you come from? <laughs> Were there any other locations or parks that it was supposed to go? Oh, here's a curious thing. Uh, we had a division called CTS, Community Transportation uh, uh, Services, uh, which is kind of a secret hidden thing. There's some, some stuff for sale over there if you want to find it. Um, the Houston thing was supposed to be an outgrowth of CTS, but it wasn't. Houston turned out to be one of those crazy one-off things that came up, and I don't know who in this company started it, but Houston needed an underground railroad to replace an underground thing that they had that wasn't working very well. And this was going to be a linear motor thing, so I was the lead engineer on the first uh, uh, field surveys of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and the job got handed off to everybody else. But um, somewhere in my archives, our archives, eventually for sale, I have the only T-shirt left over from the Houston Wedway saying, we did it in Houston. <laughs> so 
Uh, you ask the question. You go try and find and buy that. Yeah. We we need that shirt. I think everybody here yeah. would buy that one. That's all right. So these are going to be rapid fire, a little bit quicker answers. Uh, you can't think as long, but at the same time, these are also people's questions, and some are mine too. So, uh, what's the uh, top speed you've driven this monorail on here? Forty-three. Is that through the contemporary? I drove it through the contemporary. <laughs> through. Yeah, 43. Straight through the, straight through. Twice. <laughs> do you know how small, do you know how small the opening the train goes through when I'm going 43 miles an hour? <laughs> Your favorite ride? The fire engine at Disneyland, because I talked Walt into it. I wanted a fire engine. He wanted one, too, so we built a fire engine. It's my favorite. All right. Stupidest, craziest thing you've done in the parks? Craziest, stupidest thing. To... Everything I did down there, I think. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. All right. This is a, uh, I like this is a good one for, it's a race car question. You got to pick two of these. There's three choices, but you got to pick two. Fast, cheap, and reliable. Which two do you pick? Reliable. What's the next one? Fast. All right. <laughs> then it's going to be expensive. How many Autopia cars have you had to push? Well, on opening day at Disneyland for the Autopia, we had uh, 37 cars on the ride. The end of the week, we had two on the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, I had a Cadillac convertible with my own tools. We had no mechanics in those days. And I had my Cadillac every day parked at the Utopia ride repairing the cars while redesigning everything that broke. That was probably the blackest part of my life right there. And yes, I had to push them to the place where I could work on them. Yes, every one of them. Every one of them, okay. Favorite place on property at Disney World? Favorite place on property at Disney World? I always think of Disneyland. I, I like the Granny's Cabin. Oh, Disney World. I think getting up early in the morning and, and uh, trying to go into the back gate of Epcot before it opens and successfully talk my way in because to see Epcot in the morning with the dew on the plant materials and there's nobody there except me. There's something about this place. Good answer. All right, you've got a garage. You can only put two cars in it. Which two cars do you put in your garage? Well, the ones I own. <laughs> no, 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 any car, any okay. car. All right, oh, okay. Uh, I would um, love to get a hold of a restored Formula One race car. What vintage? I put, I put that in there. What year? Oh, the... Uh, Almost any year. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, okay. Well, if you really want to know, yeah, it'd be a, it'd be a uh, street road, a street uh, con converted uh, 1927 Bugatti Type 57. All right, that's uh, one. What's the second? Second. Need something I'd, if it rains, maybe, right? I'd I'd love to have a Ferrari F40. The F40 is very cool. F40. Oh. <laughs> That's the well, last I, one no. that Enzo touched, really. That's the That's last right. one. That's right. Well, I, I, had a, I had a Ferrari Lusso for seven years. Okay. No, in your life, if you're a car guy, you've got to do anything you can to have a Ferrari once. I, yeah, yeah. I, sure. I would love that. <laughs> More of a Chevy guy, but that's cool. <laughs> All right. This is a good question. I think this is a, a, a big one to kind of wrap it up here and uh, get to the, the big big picture. What do you want your legacy to be known as? Your, your final overall encompassing thing. Legacy, what is it? Tell us everything you got on that. And you can ramble on this one. I'll let you go. Um, I'm, I'm sort of modest in a way, uh, believe it or not. Uh, I'm sort of startled by the adulation that people, you know, Imagineers as a group get. It's just sort of startling. But at the same time, I do have to be patient and recognize that somebody really wants 
to honor you or they want to thank you because they had their family had a good day. Uh, and sometimes, and some of you know it out there, you come up and you go, oh, and I say, no gushing. I got to, if, if you calm down, I'd love to talk to you, but I can't talk to you when you're doing this. It's kind of, it's kind of a startling thing to get used to. Uh, I don't even give a thought to a legacy because it's going to be assigned by everybody else. Okay. Well, that was it, Bob. I appreciate your time up here. Thank you for answering our questions. Thank you, everybody. All right. And that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We'll take it out here. Okay.